Okay, um, I'm saying that we're live on Facebook now. I'm going to just try and verify this. Uh, yes, it appears that we're live on Facebook. Um, unfortunately, to do things on Facebook, I have to go to uh, um, show a bunch of stuff on my screen. Let's just, uh, again, you know, um, just start with this quote. Um, you know, follow along in your mind. Think about this quote. Um, the reason that we're doing this work, I wish to be. I can be, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be, I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. I wish to be to help others. This is to be understood as a vow. So I would like to thank uh, any of you who have joined us on Facebook Live. My name is Alan Clues. Um, welcome to the online Gertjev group that we hold every Sunday morning at uh, 1030. I'm just going to uh, stop sharing this so that we can see some of our participants. And I would like to say good morning um, to all of you. Uh, good morning, Brian. How are things in Scottsdale, Arizona? Nice and dry and sunny and warm. Yep, thanks. Very good. What's the... What's the temperature out there? Uh, right now, it's about mid seventies. Mid seventies. Okay. It'll get hot uh, later, but right now it's perfect. Yeah, mid seventies is about uh, for those like me who are metric. It's about twenty two, twenty three degrees. Um, wonderful temperature. Sounds good. Um, Karen, how are things in Mexico? It's a beautiful day. Everything's really beautiful, warm, but not hot. Um, Spring flowers. has come and flowers and uh, oh, flowers everywhere. My roses are beautiful. I'm very happy in my garden. Do you have roses out now this time of year? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, for us up here, you know, we keep on uh, uh, having a bit of uh, uh, snow every every now and again. Um, it just seems to be getting warmer, and then it goes back to winter. Um, Ian, how are things in Portland, Oregon? Uh, we got clear skies, bright sun, but it's still a little cold outside. What do you know in temperature? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm bad at guessing such things. Maybe 50 something. 50 something. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're in Toronto here. Um, we're, I, I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit, but in Celsius, we're, eight, uh, uh, we're going up to eight or nine degrees today. And today's going to be my first uh, of the season Toronto mindfulness walk. I have a meetup group called Toronto Mindfulness Walks. And uh, I think I have about 20 people registered. Um, I was gonna try and do it two weeks ago, but it was pouring rain. So uh, I'm gonna try and do it every two weeks until it gets really hot. Um, so let's just begin by bringing ourselves back to our body. Back to this most important awareness that we can have, the sensation of ourself. And although I read that quote, um, that we wish to do this inner work to help humanity and our fellow human beings, uh, it's always good to begin any kind of inner work with some kind of an affirmation. So, you know, I do this inner work for myself. I do this inner work for my fellow human being, and I do this inner work for the earth herself. So that whenever we work, whenever we do inner work, whenever we do uh, this kind of activity, we're not just doing it for ourselves. It has ramifications that extend out beyond us. So let's just begin by becoming aware of the sensation of air as it flows in through our nose, nasal cavity, back of mouth, throat, past our vocal cords, into our lungs. And try to sense the movement of air as it flows in and then back out. Try to trace it along that path, you know, the path from our nose to the nasal cavity, to the back of the mouth, to the throat, past the vocal cords, down the airwaves, into the lungs, and back out again. And then become aware of your diaphragm, the 
muscle that is the major organ, the major engine of our breath and breathing. The diaphragm is actually a parachute-shaped muscle. It's right under our lungs and our solar plexus. And as it expands down, it pulls the lungs open. And then as it contracts back up, the lungs, we get the air pushed out of them and they kind of close. Not really close, but the air is pushed out. So become aware of the movement of your diaphragm as it expands down the diaphragmic cavity and then contracts back up. Become aware of the fact that your diaphragm and your lungs together act similar to a set of bellows. As your diaphragm expands down, it's like the bellows open and the air gets pulled in. And as the diaphragm contracts back up, it's like the bellows get pushed shut and the air gets pushed out. And then become aware of the fact that your diaphragm is connected to the abdominal muscles. So as you breathe, there's also an expansion and contraction of the muscles and various muscles in your abdomen that goes along with the movement of the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is also connected through nerves to the intercostal muscles between the ribs. So become aware of how the diaphragm is like a maestro that you know organizes the movement of all of these muscles, the abdominal muscles and the muscles in the lungs between the ribs. Become aware of the centrality of your diaphragm in the process of breathing. And then return a bit of your awareness to the sensation of air as it flows in and out. Aware of this movement of air in and out. Aware of the movement of your diaphragm, abdomen, the muscles between your ribs. And let's take this just one step further and involve the head brain slightly, particularly the imaginative faculty or powers of the head brain. And so as you breathe in, imagine breathing in oxygen. Imagine breathing in higher particles contained within the air. And you can use your full range of imagination. I tend to like the idea of imagining breathing in sparkles of luminosity, sparkles of light. Sparkles for me, particularly of yellow light, of sunlight, um, breathing in particles of light. And then as I breathe out, to imagine breathing out a gray, foggy waste. They estimate that 70%, 70, 70 percent of the body's waste products are exhaled. We don't flush them down the toilet or sweat them out the skin. We breathe them out. And so our breath not only feeds us with our second being food, air, it is also uh, tremendously detoxifying. It cleanses the body. So become aware as you breathe in that you are breathing in perhaps particles of light, particles of oxygen. And as you breathe out, you're breathing out a gray, foggy waste. Aware of the sensation of air as it flows in through your nose, nasal cavity, back of mouth, throat, past your vocal cords, into your lungs, and back out again. Aware of the movement of your diaphragm and the associated muscles in the abdomen and the lungs. And aware of the fact that through breathing in, we are feeding our body. And through breathing out, we are cleansing our body. So let's begin by taking some nice, deep breaths. So breathe nice and deeply, right down to the bottom lobes of your lungs, and then breathe back out again. Just become aware of your body breathing. In the Great Discourse on Mindfulness, the Buddha starts by saying, become aware of the air flowing in and out of your nostrils. And then he says, become aware of the air flowing from your nostrils down into your lungs and back out again. And then he says, become aware 
of your whole body breathing. Become aware of the oxygenation, the feeding of your body as you breathe. Aware of your body, aware of your breath. And we're just going to do a self-sensing exercise that comes from Mr. Gurji via George Adi, uh, one of his English pupils who emigrated to Australia. So as you remain aware of your breathing, as you remain aware of the sensation of air flowing in and out, as you remain aware of the muscles involved in breathing, as you remain aware of breathing in, perhaps particles of light, sparkles of light, luminosity, particles of oxygen, and breathing out a gray, foggy waste. Just allow your attention to rest. Just allow your attention to rest, and then focus your attention on your right shoulder, your right upper arm, your right elbow and the bend behind your right elbow, your right lower arm, your right wrist, the palm of your right hand, your right thumb, index finger, middle finger, fourth finger, baby finger, the top of your right hand and moving back up, your right wrist, lower arm, elbow, upper arm, right up to your right shoulder. And then try to become aware of your whole right arm. And as you remain aware of your right arm, divide your attention and become aware of your right hip. Aware of your right arm and your right hip, your right upper leg, your right knee and the bend behind your right knee, your right shin and calf, the bottom of your right foot, including your instep, your right big toe, second toe, middle toe, fourth toe, baby toe, the top of your right foot, and then moving back up your right ankle, lower leg, knee, upper leg to your right hip, and then become aware of your whole right leg while, rain, uh, while remaining aware of your right arm. And while remaining aware of your right arm and right leg, divide a part of your attention and become aware of your left hip, your left upper leg, your left knee and the bend behind your left knee, your left shin and calf, your left ankle, the bottom of your left foot, including your instep, your left baby toe, fourth toe, middle toe, second toe, your left big toe, the top of your left foot, and moving back up your left ankle, lower leg, knee, upper leg to your left hip, and then become aware of your entire left leg while remaining aware of your right leg and right arm, aware of your right arm, right leg, and left leg. And then divide your attention again, and while remaining, holding on to this awareness of your right arm, right leg, and left leg, Become aware of your left shoulder, your left upper arm, your left elbow and the bend behind your left elbow, your left lower arm, your left wrist, the palm of your left hand, your left baby finger, fourth finger, middle finger, second finger, um, or second finger, index finger, thumb, the top of your left hand and moving back up your left wrist, lower arm, elbow, upper arm to your left elbow and then become aware of your whole left arm while remaining aware of your right arm, right leg and left leg. Become aware of all four of these limbs together, your right arm, right leg, left leg and left arm and try to hold your awareness on these four limbs as you begin to move slowly with your awareness up the spine, I would like you to begin with the very, very bottom vertebrae uh, in your tailbone, below the pelvic bone, um, sacral number five. Then move up to sacral number four, still in the tailbone, sacral number three, two, 
one. And then as the spine moves above the hip into the lower back, become aware of lumbar. Five, four, three, two, one. And then moving into the middle back, become aware of thoracic 12, 11, 10, nine, eight. Moving into your upper back, the vertebrae in your upper back, seven, thoracic seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And then moving into the cervical vertebrae in your neck, cervical seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And become aware of your whole spine from sacral five at the very bottom to cervical one, right at the very top. Aware of your spine and your four limbs. Aware of your right arm, right leg, left leg, left arm, and your whole spine. And then moving up to the occipital bone in the back of your skull. Then the temporal bones in the sides of your skull. The parietal bone at the very top of your skull. The frontal bone just behind your forehead. And then become aware of all of these skull bones, the occipital, the temporal, the parietal, and the frontal bones. And then move your awareness down into the bones that form your eye socket, the sphenoid bones or the wing-shaped bones that form your eye sockets. Become aware of your eyes resting in your eye sockets. And then move down into your nasal bones at the roof of your mouth and then into your facial bones with your upper teeth and nose, and then move into your mouth. Become aware of the inside of your mouth, your tongue. Become aware of the flesh below your tongue. And then become aware of your jaw. Become aware of the teeth in your jawbone, your chin, your jaw. And then move your awareness into the back of your mouth and down your throat and become aware of your throat and then move down into your chest become aware of your heart your lungs become aware of your rib cage expanding your whole chest across your chest and then move down into your solar plexus become aware of the muscles in your solar plexus your stomach Move into your, your duodenum, then become aware of your abdominal muscles, your abdominal cavity, your large, small intestines, the various uh, abdominal organs within your abdominal cavity, and then moving down into your pelvic region and ending with your reproductive organs. So becoming aware of all four limbs, your spine, the bones in your skull, the bones in your head, down your throat, your chest, your solar plexus, your abdomen, your pelvis, down to your reproductive organs. Try to develop the sensation of self uh, that begins with this pattern. Right arm, right leg, left leg, left arm, uh, spine, skull, facial bones, throat, chest, abdomen, solar plexus, abdomen, pelvis to the reproductive organs. Try to become aware of your entire physical body. Try to develop an awareness of your organic body, your physical organic body as one whole. Try to develop the awareness, the sensation of your whole body at once, to sense your whole body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, from side to side, from front to back at once. Try to really inhabit your body, to sense your body as best as you can. And then we're going to move into um, sort of intermediate, self-remembering. This is not the most advanced form of self-remembering, but do your best to maintain an awareness of your physical body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. Become aware as much as you can of your physical body, 
your physical body breathing, the sensation of air flowing in and out, the movement of the various muscles involved in breathing, even try to become aware of your skeletal system and some of the inner sensations within your body. And try to hold this awareness of your physical body in the back of your awareness. Uh, so to divide your attention in one part holds on to the awareness of your physical body and the other part simply becomes aware of all of the information flowing in through your eyes. So become aware of your physical body and really also focus on your eyes, sense your eyes, become aware of your eyes as organs of perception, as organs that allow you to see light and to see the different manifestations of light and to become aware of all of the light flowing into your eyes. Really take a moment with your eyes and while perhaps looking at the screen and keeping your eyes centered in front of you. Become aware of the top of your vision. Then become aware of the edge of your vision, the right side. Then become aware of the bottom of your peripheral vision. And then become aware of the left side of your peripheral vision. So working around your peripheral vision, let's do this again. Well, focusing center, become aware of your peripheral vision at the top, towards the right, to the bottom, to the left, and then back up again. And then perhaps as you continue to stare in front of you, notice the intensity of colors, the intensity of the light of the objects in front of you and become aware of the multitude of colors that are entering your eyes. And then let's move to the ears and do a similar exercise. We have sort of a focal point of our hearing and we have peripheral hearing. So perhaps hearing my voice, maybe hearing computer sounds, maybe hearing sounds around you. Become aware that you can hear potentially peripheral sounds at the top, at the back, at the bottom, towards the front. Really pay attention to the fact that you can direct your hearing as you can direct your eyes. It's more noticeable with the movement of our eyes, but we can direct our hearing as well. So become aware of what you can hear at the top of your hearing, at the back of your hearing, behind you, at the bottom, towards the ground, in front of you, and then going out, extending out from your ears. Become aware of what you can hear. Become aware of your ears as organs of perception, as the organs that receive sound. And become aware that the sound, for instance, of my voice is a wave that flows into your ears. And then the hairs in your ears are moved by the sound. And then they translate the sound wave into an electrical signal. And what you are hearing is really the result of your brain interpreting the electrical signal. This is part of the transformation of energies. Energy comes in from the outside, the hairs in our ear, ears transforms this energy into electrical impulses in our brain. And so this gives us an insight into the transformation of energy involved in the receiving of external impressions. The same thing happens with our eyes. We have 10 million photoreceptors in our eyes receiving light, but they translate that light 
into electrical signals. And there is that transformation of energy involved in all of our external impressions in what we receive from the outside world. Now, become aware of your nose. Become aware of the olfactory receptors in your nose. They're all up in the nasal cavity where you can smell scents. And try to become aware of the scents around you. And also realize that you can direct your nose. We can locate scents through our nose. We can become aware of a scent on the peripheral of our nose. Perhaps there's a scent coming in from one of the windows or a scent of one of the animals sitting you know, beside us that we can become aware of the direction of scent, that we can somehow use our nose to locate scents, to locate smells, so we can become aware of smells that are sort of in the center of our olfactory awareness, and we can also begin to differentiate more subtle smells in the background. And then become aware of our taste buds. Become aware of the taste in your mouth. If you're drinking coffee, you know, become aware of the taste of coffee, perhaps in your mouth or whatever the taste in your mouth is right in this moment. Become aware of the fact that we have taste buds on the top and the roof of our mouth, on our tongue, in different parts of our mouth, and that we're able to um, perceive salty, savory. There's a number of categories that we can perceive with our mouth and with the taste buds in our mouth. And again, Try to bring your awareness back to your body. Try to inhabit your body as we then again move through the external impressions. As we become aware of the external impressions entering into our eyes, and at the moment they enter into our eyes, they are transformed into an electrical signal. And so we're not really seeing the world around us. We're our, we are seeing the electrical signal and become aware of the electrical signals that are being transformed in our ears, the sounds we're picking up. Become aware of the smells in our nose, the taste in our mouth. And to do this as much as we can, in other words, to mindfully look, mindfully listen, mindfully smell, and mindfully taste is to engage the head brain as fully as we can in being here and now in this moment on focusing on the now and the interesting thing is that we don't have to flip from vision to hearing to smell to taste try to become aware of the light entering your eyes and while remaining aware of your eyes receiving light, become aware of your ears hearing sound and receiving sounds. And while remaining aware of your eyes receiving light, your ears receiving sound, also become aware of your nose receiving scent, your mouth receiving taste. Try to become aware of these four perceptions at the same time, looking, listening, smelling, and tasting. Try to overlap them, and then try to hold the awareness of your physical self, the sensation of self in the back of your awareness. And as I said, this is basic, or not basic, this is really intermediate self-remembering. Basic self-remembering would be consciously looking while sensing my body. But looking with mindful awareness, looking, hearing, smelling, and tasting all at the same time while remaining aware of our body is intermediate self-remembering.
Full self-remembering is to bring an awareness of our emotions and what we are feeling right now in this moment emotionally. So full self-remembering involves the head brain, the body brain, and the feeling brain. But like any muscles, any advanced form of exercise, any advanced form of movement, we have to slowly train ourselves step by step to develop this awareness. It starts with the body. Become aware of the sensation of yourself. Become aware of your organic self. Become aware of your body as one organic whole. This is the most important awareness because it is so basic. And then while holding this awareness of your physical body, become aware of what you can see, conscious, mindful, aware of the information coming in through your eyes. And then hold on to this awareness of your eyes and your body and become aware of your ears and the sound and your nose and the smells and your mouth and the taste buds. So looking, listening, smelling, tasting together while remaining aware of your physical body. And this is, as I said, it's sort of intermediate uh, self-remembering. When I lead my uh, walking group today, Toronto Mindfulness Walks, this is what I will be having them doing. I will be narrating the walking process trying to get them to consciously look or mindfully look, listen, smell, and taste while sensing their body moving and walking. Because we do not have to limit these activities to a special time that we set aside and do a special sitting at that special time. We should be bringing this out into the world and to be as mindful as present of this moment here and now as we can wherever we are and whatever we are doing so just in conclusion just become aware of your eyes receiving energy while remaining aware of your physical body become aware of your ears receiving sound while remaining aware of your physical body Become aware of your nose, your mouth, receiving smell, taste, while remaining aware of your physical body. And do it all at once. Mindfully look, listen, smell, taste, while sensing your physical body. And understand that as you are doing this, you are also growing your inner being in a balanced excuse me, in a harmonious fashion by doing it in the proper form and sequence with the proper understanding, we grow and leave crystallizations. We leave memories of this state behind within ourselves. And these memories, these crystallizations grow together and they eventually create what Mr. Gurdjieff called an inner being, a Kestrian body. And it's through this application of the power of attention to become aware of the things that we can become aware of, done in the proper form and sequence that allows this creation of the Kestrian body, that inner being body within us to grow in a proper and harmonious fashion. Now just allow your attention to rest. Just allow your attention to rest, and then we're going to finish with the collected state exercise. As the earth is surrounded by an atmosphere, we too are surrounded by an atmosphere. Unfortunately for most people, our atmosphere, their atmospheres are dispersed. They're pulled this way and that way. And, you know, what you think about your atmosphere goes towards, what grabs your attention pulls your atmosphere towards it. And most people do not collect the emanations that form within their atmosphere. They do not collect their atmosphere 
keep it close to them. So just pull your atmosphere back towards yourself. Keep it about a meter, meter and a half wide. Imagine yourself surrounded by like a bubble or a cocoon, just keeping yourself uh, surrounded by this atmosphere, aware of this atmosphere around you. Try to become aware of the boundary of this atmosphere, where it ends. And we can become aware of the boundary of the atmosphere. and Keep it still. Keep it calm. Keep it tranquil. And then I'm going to count from one up to three. And when I get to three, I want us to breathe the atmosphere in. One, two, three. Breathe the atmosphere in. And as we breathe out, imagine something remains. Imagine something settles within ourselves. And then um, it's always good to end with an affirmation. So I would like you to, you know, this is Mr. Gurdjieff's affirmation. May results of this exercise, repeat that in your mind, may results of this exercise be transubstantiated within me for my being. And then just, you know, for the rest of the meeting, try to remain as aware of yourself as you can especially your physical body. Um, we should always begin with the physical body so that we get so good at it that we can hold the awareness of our physical body sort of in the background, in second position. This awareness of our physical body can never be mechanical. It can never be habitual. It has to be the result of intent. It has to be the result of a deliberate and intentional focusing of our awareness. So you can never accidentally become mindful of your sensation of self. It requires a conscious act. It requires an act of intent, even if we hold it in the background of our, aware our awareness. Um, are there any questions, anything people would like to talk about today? Um, I'll be quiet for a minute. Anyone else, anyone want to ask a question? Want to say anything? Uh, I have a question. Uh, it's a little bit random, but um, in, in Search for uh, the Miraculous, he talks about the legitimate ways versus the illegitimate ways um, of uh, I guess growing your being mm -hmm. and um, you know it seems to be kind of trending now where a lot of people they're um, I guess they're using you know, like you can call them like plant medicines or mm -hmm. different things and they you know that's uh, it seems to be popular is that what he would consider illegitimate ways right uh, not necessarily um, in his, uh, well, it's not his book, it was compiled uh, relatively recently. There's a book called, um, um, I forget the name of it now, um, G.I. Gurdjieff Talks 1914 to 1931, um, something like that. He has a full chapter on the use of narcotics, which he used the word narcotics rather than you know plant medicine or anything like that and he discusses in there how under the proper proper circumstances and in the proper conditions these substances actually can be used for self-study um in one quote he said it's like standing not quite this is a my interpretation of his quote it's like standing on a chair looking over a fence to where we're going. Um, he says it gives us the opportunity to see a bit further down the road. Um, but he also, you know, talked about the fact that uh, it has to be done in very, very rigorous uh, circumstances, uh, usually in the context of an esoteric school or people who know what they're talking about. 
And unfortunately, um, you know, with the substances uh, today, it often feels like the Wild West. Um, there are teenagers who are using sacred substances at parties um, rather than, you know, doing it the proper set and setting and making it a religious and spiritual event. They're just using it to get out of their heads. And so that there's a lot of misuse um, with this as well. He also discussed it partially. It's only in three paragraphs in Beelzebub Tales to his grandson where he says that there are certain plants that absorb the energy of the earth in the earthly realm. And then he said that there are other plants that absorb the active elements of the planetary and the solar realm. And then he said further, there are plants that absorb the active elements of the megalocosmos. So we're talking about potentially the realm of the Godhead or the, you know, at least the realm of the holy denying, hydrogen six, possibly. Um, so he did talk about these substances, but he was very, you know, it, it's, it's like the Wild West with what people are doing. And um, they're not doing them properly. They're not doing them with the right supervision, with the right intention. Some people are. Uh, some people are turning, uh, uh, using them in a very sacred way. Um, so those are, they can be legitimate, but uh, they can also be illegitimate. Um, it's not something that we should just go out and try to experiment on our own and to see what results that uh, uh, we can get. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure if that fully answers your question. Um, I, I seem to get an impression that, you know, w uh, that he may have been talking about something else. Can you be a little bit more specific? Uh, it, where, where in In Search of the Miraculous did he talk about illegitimate influences? Uh, uh, he was talking about the, you know, how the um, fakir gets what he needs in 30 days. Uh, the, okay. um, uh, the yogi gets what he needs in, I think it was a week. And then... Yeah. Or the monk gets it in a week, and then the yogi gets it in a day. And then yeah. he said, "There's that's when he, it was. You know, it was almost sounded like a riddle." And he's like, "Well, then there's other illegitimate ways, which, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I don't know. It was, it was kind of a confusing paragraph. I probably read it like ten times trying to figure yeah. it out." Oh yeah, no, I, I I've actually um, I don't know if I can find it. I, mean, uh, I can get I can get it. Uh, I have it right over here. I can pull it up if you want it. Uh, no, I, um, there was something that I shared in uh, the specific context of that. Um, because, you know, he, he, I believe in that quote, he, he actually uses, or it's translated into English. It's like a pill that he can take. Yeah, exactly. Um, and um, I might not be able to find the specific one um let me maybe go back to it yeah i probably can't find it but it doesn't really uh yeah i'll go back to another one um the conscious breathing uh the work that we are doing um is really the assimilation of these pills. Um, so let me just give me a second. I've shown this. I've got one where I actually have it outlined. Um, but the pills, in a sense that he's talking about in that context, let me get the draw, is are these substances here? Um, this substance, uh, this substance, and this substance, and then also, um, I'm not going to circle these ones. I'll try to put an X. This one, um, and this, well, excuse me, let me get rid of those last two. I don't want to confuse this. Um, through the breathing that we do, 
through conscious breathing, we are breathing in the higher molecules that are contained within the air. We are, by consciously breathing, um, I've done some more advanced breathing exercises in various meetings. Through that, we are breathing in the higher carbons, the higher substances that we need to engage in this inner alchemy. Rather than waiting for these substances just to naturally accumulate within us, by doing the conscious breathing. Um, there's one particular exercise that I have on uh, the YouTube channel, the Toronto Gurdjieff group called the morning sitting that goes a little bit more into the breathing and becoming aware of something arising in the solar plexus and then moving down to the reproductive organs. What we are actually doing are we are collecting those energies necessary for this higher, more advanced alchemical work. And it's, I, don't, I wouldn't use the word illegitimate, but it is kind of like a cheat, understanding this. Um, there's a problem, for instance, within the way of, uh, pretty well most ways, but the, the, the way that they teach in the East that we think of as the spiritual path, is actually all based on the transformation of the octave of food. It doesn't involve the proper uh, first conscious shock. It doesn't involve the proper harmonious development of our being. And so, in a sense, the monastic way can be considered to be an illegitimate way. They hack into the process of transformation. They don't do the conscious breathing. They don't work on all three brains. They work on the physical brain, and they work in a very specific way on the physical brain. Um, in order to transform in that way, you have to uh, take uh, monastic vows. You have to become celibate. You have to go and be willing to renounce your family, to leave the world, to uh, join a celibate order of monks in the middle of the forest, to shave your head, to get rid of any kind of personal identity. And through hacking the process, they can achieve enlightenment. But it's not really a proper and legitimate way. Um, it involves the hacking and the transformation and the use of C12, which is the highest um, active element produced by the normal human being. In order to properly grow, we've got to uh, get uh, not just C12, but uh, SO12 and um, uh, I forget the, the other one, um, SO12 and ME12. Uh, all of those have to be used. Me, uh, so 12, me 12, and uh, or C12, so 12, and me 12 are the actual pills that he's referring to in that quote that we can take to achieve certain results within a day. Um, other paths are not aware of the nature of the second conscious shock, they're not aware of self remembering and the receiving of impressions and developing those other octaves, the octave of air and the octave of food. And so the monastic way, um, I mean, it's, it's really ingenious. If you want to do a study of the misuse of C12, the misuse of sexual energy, and understand how central this understanding is to the work so that we don't bleed and leak this energy out into the world. Engage in a thought experiment and imagine what it's like to spend your whole life in a monastery. You know, perhaps when you are seven or eight, you're left outside a monastery. Um, your head is shaved. You put on robes that everyone else puts on. You spend the rest of your life there. There are no 
weekends. There are no Fridays. There are no Mondays. Each day is like the day before, and each day will be like the next day. Any kind of um, anything interesting, anything different has been filtered out. Um, the monastic environment, as you know, set up by the Buddha, not necessarily you know the monasteries that we find in North America today, but the monastic environment as set up by the Buddha around 600 uh, BC, were engineered from, you know, getting up in the morning to going to sleep at night to preventing us from use or, or misusing C12. You stare at a wall or you stare at a garden, you meditate, any thing that could uh, sort of catch your ego, long hair that may differentiate you from someone else, shaved off. You know, you may want to express yourself through your clothing. You don't. You all wear the same monastic robes. You, you basically get rid of your identity. You get rid of all of those things that are actually the result of the misuse of C12. And so you lead a very bland life in many ways, a very inward life, a very contemplative life. But this is a hack. Um, it's not the proper way to go about awakening. We are actually supposed to awaken in the world. And so there are these ways, and they're legitimate, but they're illegitimate because they require us to flee from the world, to renounce our family, to renounce our name, to get rid of anything that would sort of shine a light on us as individuals and really just focus on the physical body, on the breathing, and on doing the inner work. And, you know, after 30 years, something changes uh, under that situation. But... You know, within the, the fourth way tradition, he implies it's easier and quicker and slyer, but it's not really. Uh, the thing about the fourth way is it's more rounded. It's more fully grounded. We don't just work on the octave of food. We don't just work with C12 and the sexual energy. We also work on the octave of air, on the breath, with so 12 the, the equivalent, uh, you know, awakened energy as C12, but for our emotions and for our breath and our breathing. And we also work with me 12 with our impressions, with the impressions that we receive through our eyes, ears, nose, taste buds. And so it's a more grounded, more well-rounded approach. Um, so the other... You know, the monastic one is really like an illegitimate hack that works. They've learned to hack into the process, but it requires extreme leaving the world, extreme isolation and getting away from all of those influences that could uh, cause a monk to sort of trip up. And, you know, Mr. Gurdjieff said that, you know, monks can be incredibly holy inside the monastery, but you take them out of the monastery, you put them in street clothes and you force them into the world. And all of the work and what they've gained in the monastery doesn't help them in the world. And, you know, we've seen, you know, YouTube videos of, you know, Buddhist monks and, you know, smoking cigars and drinking whiskey and engaging in behavior they shouldn't. Um, because in the monastic walls, they can do it, but otherwise they can't. Um, so that's part of what Mr. Gurdjieff's referring to there as well. Um, through the understanding of the human machine, through the understanding of the octaves of food, the food diagrams, the octave of food, the octave of air, the octave of impressions, through understanding the nature of inner growth, through all of this, we... The, you know, this is the, really the legitimate way, and, you know, the other ways quite often use acts. 
And, you know, then there are, you know, we can get out into the world and we can talk about theosophy or anthroposophy or, you know, kundalini yoga or whatever. And there are so many people who are engaging in sort of, you know, um, you know, I can't think of the word. Um, it's like McDonald's, but Mac and Light McMindfulness kind of thing. And they're engaging and thinking that they're doing all of this work. Um, I mean, the number of people who, I'm a Canadian, I live in Toronto, who I meet and they go, oh, Eckhart Tolle. And I'm not a fan of Eckhart Tolle. He's a, um, he's a, 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 a neo Um He doesn't fully understand the philosophy that he's talking about. There are some conceptual problems in his books, um, but coming from the Gurdjieff teachings, coming from a real solid teaching, I'm able to look at other teachings and sort of see where they're lacking. Um, so, the, you know, we live in a marketplace with people trying to make lots of money through spirituality, through teaching people how to grow. Eckhart Tolle, his book, The Power of Now, he thought, you know, awakening was so easy. He writes the book and everyone's going to awaken. And how many people have awoken from receive, uh, reading The Power of Now? Uh, because it's not a system. It doesn't break it down into practical steps and practical techniques, uh, which the Gurdjieff system does. Um, I mean, this is an incredible system. Uh, it's an incredible understanding of ourselves, of the fact that we are really cosmic apparatuses designed for the transformation of energies. And everything that we talk about is actually really at its basic level, the transformation of energies. In order to be mindful, in order to sense my body, in order to be aware of the air that touches my face, the hair on my head, the clothing on my body, I have to be able to transform a specific energy, a higher energy. And if I'm leaking energy at the lower level, if I'm wasting this energy, then I will not be able to accumulate enough of it in order to become aware of myself, in order to sense my hands, in order to become aware of my breath, in order to become mindful of what I can see, hear, smell, taste, in order to become aware of feeling and becoming aware of my emotional content. Um, so understanding that it's all related to energy, it's all related to the conservation of energy, uh, that these higher states are really related to energy. You know, the a state of waking sleep is fueled by hydrogen 48. The mindful state or the state that Mr. Gurdjieff defines as personal consciousness is fueled by hydrogen 24. The awakened state is fueled by hydrogen 12. And learning where we're leaking energy, learning the, you know, the, the problems within us um, is, you know, how we develop along this system. Um, I, I actually sent something to, uh, I'm just, you know, let me see if I can just quickly find this. Um, my apologies to those who are uh, um, watching. Um, let me see if I can put this up on I had actually sent this to uh, Angelica and we didn't say hi Angelica because you came in a little bit late um, how are things in Brazil um, no, okay. nice uh, yes good time good weather and Okay, I'm, I'm going to just, I, I sent this to Angelica. I didn't really explain. I meant to explain it. Um, hopefully we can see it. Sleep had seven features. Adi, this is George Adi, um, one of Mr. Gurdjieff's English pupils who moved to Australia. Adi told us that waking sleep has seven features. So these are the ways we leak energy. 
So if we are not able to maintain an awareness of our physical self from the moment we wake up to when we go to bed, or if we're not able to be present as often as we would like, it's probably as a result of leaking energy in one of these seven ways. So the first one is through the process of identification. This is where we forget about ourselves. We are no longer aware of ourselves. And whatever our mind is focused on, we are completely absorbed in that. Um, a classical form of identification is reading a novel. Um, you know, I've seen people reading novels, standing on the subway. I've even seen people reading them, walking down the street, you know, towards the end of the novel, they want to finish it. But when you think about it, you read a novel and you get submersed in this imaginative world. And that's a form of identification. You watch a television show, you know, it's a suspenseful action oriented television show and your heart begins to beat faster and your blood pressure goes up. It's because you are in a state of identification. You have identified and your awareness and attention has been pulled in to that show. Um, the other day I saw a 50 year old man on the bus he was wearing a toronto maple leafs shirt and he had i think gold leafs painted onto his face and he was with a friend who had another was wearing another toronto maple leaf shirt i guess uh, it's the hockey playoffs and uh coming down to the stanley cup or whatever um i don't follow sports but i realized that you know it had to be an inspiration important day in terms of you know the, the the hockey game and these people were so identified with the home team with the toronto maple leafs um so identification is a huge huge way we leak energy where our awareness is just taken and used by something mechanical and Mr. Gurdjieff said that our attention is one of the most precious qualities we have. And that when a moment of inattention can never be recovered. So we think about a movie that we saw, or we get lost in a novel, or we watch TV, or we think about a conversation we had, or we, you know, mull something over in our mind. These are generally forms of identification. And identification is the enemy of self-remembering. So it's a misuse, and identification is a misuse of C12. It's one of the ways we leak that energy that we should be using to come back to an awareness of our body. Uh, another one he said was considering. And by this, he meant internal considering. And internal considering is actually a form of identification, but it's different enough from identification to become its own category. And considering, this is, you know, we're considering ourselves, and it's always focused on ourselves. That person didn't give me the respect that I deserve, or how can it rain on me today? It's all about me. Internal considering is just the ego going on and on and on and on what about me and they didn't look at me and they didn't pat me on the back and oh look at that puddle and oh look at that crap over there and um now considering has a, a, a another feature that he said which is almost as insidious and this is where we overly consider someone else you know perhaps a boss mr gurdjieff talked about these jump up people um, you know, a boss walks into a room and there are people who jump up, you know, they want to be in their good graces. Um, and, you know, so I go, I hope the boss likes me. I hope he likes this presentation or, you know, I hope that person likes me. You know, the, that, that form of considering is, you know, what did I do to hurt that person? Why are they upset at me? 
um, you know, can be a particularly insidious form of considering because we lose sight of our own objective sense of self-worth when we do that. Um, so we leak energy there. Um, we also leak energy through negative emotions. I can't believe they said that or they did that or why is it raining on me today or all of these useless emotions. And not all negative emotions are useless, just about 99.9% .9 of them. Um, these negative emotions at the base of them is always the ego, which is the same with considering. At the base of the considering, both you know the, the, the internal considering and external considering, when we do it wrong, considering others, it's always about the ego. And the same with negative emotions. I can't believe how angry they made me, or that just made me feel so sad, or whatever. Um, so through negative emotions, and if you pay attention to yourself, you may realize that you get stuck in certain habitual negative emotional states. So negative emotions are also a way that we leak energy. Unnecessary talking. Um, this was my mother's big one. My mother would talk to her cats. She would talk to her plants. If there was no one to talk to, she would talk to the wall. She talked and she talked and she talked. Um, there are some people who just, you know, in, in situations, they just can't help themselves. And so learning how to talk when necessary and to only convey the necessary information can be very important for some people. Another way we leak energy is through lying. And a lot of this, we lie all the time. Um, you know, they've done studies and they find that most people lie two to three times within a five minute conversation. Um, usually they're white lies, they're lies about nothing. Um, and pay attention to yourself. Do you try to say things in a way so people don't get upset? Is that kind of lying or not? Do you actually lie? Where do you lie? Why do you lie? Uh, and it extends well beyond this. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said that when we claim knowledge beyond what we're, we really have, we're lying. So, you know, when I say that Donald Trump is the worst president America has ever had, I'm lying. In order for me to make that statement, I would have to be a historian of U.S. presidents. And I would have had to have done a survey of all U.S. presidents, become aware of all of their bad points, and then compared them to the reports in the media and everything that I would see about Donald Trump and make the connections. Just me sitting here as an armchair critic is a lie. There are so many beliefs that we hold that are lies. And so we've got to begin getting rid of those. Um, formatory thinking. Uh, formatory thinking is actually probably one of my biggest problems. And this is just the words that just roll around in the mind. You wake up in the morning and it starts. You know, and it's so mechanical. Um, I remember years ago, I almost got in trouble um, saying on Facebook that, you know, at times I've almost said it would be nice to be deaf. And I wasn't saying it was nice to be deaf. But imagine never having heard any words, never having any words imprinted on your head. So imagine from the time you're born, you've never heard words. You weren't able to hear. You wouldn't quite have that internal dialogue that just churns from morning to night. We wouldn't have those impressions within ourselves. And there would be sort of more quietness in our head. And so when we get into this formatory thinking, this mechanical thinking, it takes the energy that we need to become aware of ourselves and misuses this energy. 
so that when we're thinking and we're caught up in that, we're not aware of ourselves. We're not aware of our environment. We're not aware of what we're doing. Um, and then he said also daydreaming and imagination. And um, these two aspects are one feature. And here um, you can see that George I.D. spent perhaps a little bit too much time with uh, P.D. Uspensky in England, something like 30 years before he met Mr. Gurdjieff for the last 18 months of Mr. Gurdjieff's life. Um, daydreaming is bad. Imagination, it depends on what is fueling the imaginative faculty. Mr. Gurdjieff talked about um, active being mentation. It's the use of the faculty of imagination properly to review things that have happened. Um, but uh, in the form of daydreaming, it's a complete waste of energy. Um, daydreaming is a misuse of energy. It's usually the result of the emotional center stealing C12 and, you know, imagining that we're this hero or we're doing this good thing or we're engaged in charitable work or whatever. Um, when I was a teenager, I was very into daydreaming. And when I think about some of the daydreams that I had as a teenager, it's like, I can't believe that was me. Um, and it's a waste of energy. These are all ways that we leak energy. And when we don't have the energy for inner work, we cannot do the inner work. Let me just stop sharing this. Um, so for, for, for Angelica, the reason I sent that to you, Angelica, um, was because you've moved to a point where I really, you know, the whole decision exercise moving tables and stuff like that. You're doing really good at it. Um, it's now time to begin to figure out where you are leaking energy. Um, so the decision exercise helps us to become a bit more conscious throughout the day. You know, getting into that relaxed state, setting a task, and, you know, it has a couple of... Uh, Features. One, it shows us how mechanical we are and how little awareness we hold throughout the day. Um, and two, when we do the decision exercise, we notice, and this is something that everyone has noticed, that the decision exercise has a time limit. I'm not sure what the time limit is, but it seems to be the first week really able to do it, and then it begins to drop off and we begin to go back into a more mechanical state. Um, I occasionally uh, have a feature that I put on uh, my web browser, which is called the Mindfulness Bell. It comes from a website, a Buddhist community in Washington, D.C., and I can set the bell to intermitt intermittently ring in the background. But after a while, I become habituated to the bell, and I don't even notice it. So, you know, I, have to, I keep it turned off far more than I turn it on. Because after a while, all of these things go back into that low energy state where we become habituated to things and where we slip back into our old patterns. So the decision exercise gives us that impetus to become more aware. We realize that we have greater control over our awareness than we think we do. It gives us a lot of encouragement being able to do these things, um, but it eventually tapers off and it eventually loses its effectiveness. And you know, we should be setting new decision exercises, but at a certain point, it also becomes important to really begin to engage in self-observation. And, you know, to just look at ourselves and engage in self-observation is kind of useless. We have to look at ourselves through certain lenses. Um, I've talked before how the head brain compares and contrasts. The emotional brain, you know, I agree or I disagree. I like or I dislike. Whereas the um, physical brain, it's just more of a perception. 
And so we can begin to become aware of the different functions within ourselves. Oh, that's my head brain comparing. That's my feeling brain um, liking or disliking. That's my sensory brain just being aware. Uh, but at a certain point, we've got to get a little bit more specific. We've got to start looking at the ways that we ourselves as individuals leak energy. And this is, you know, another thing that Mr. Gurdjieff said about the fourth way in these teachings and this path is that there's no cookie cutter process, that it's different for everyone. And the reason it's different for everyone is because we are all different. And so we've got to figure ourselves out. And so it's great to play with the decision exercise and to get that confidence and the results of the decision exercise. But then we've got to really also begin observing ourselves. Where do I leak energy? Do I get caught up in the words? My imagination having conversations with people that I should have had and wished I had or imaginary conversations of things in the future or things I'm going to say. Do I read? I mean, my big problem is I replay certain conversations that I'm going to have, not that I've had, but that I'm going to have over and over so that I make sure that I'm going to say all the right things. And then when I actually have those conversations, it never goes the way. I imagined it in my mind and I include some things and I leave other things out and I've been trying to stop that. So if I think, you know, I'm going to meet with someone tomorrow and then I begin to imagine what I'm going to say, I will allow myself to do that once, maybe twice, and then I'll stop it because I can go back to that and back to that and back to that. And when I'm imagining that conversation, I'm not present. I'm not here. I'm not aware of my body. I'm not aware of my environment. It's the same with all of those identification, uh, considering negative emotions, lying, um, formatory thinking, daydreaming, identification. In all of those, we get trapped in that specific activity. And that consumes the energy that would otherwise be used to grow our being and to become aware of ourselves here and now. So it becomes important to begin exploring ourselves, to begin noticing where we are leaking energy. And, you know, it's generally to, you know, one of those seven categories, but there are a few more. Those are the primary ones. I like that because it's all in a single quote. Um, so, there again, I've gone off topic, but uh, um, you know, trying to pull a whole bunch of strands together. Any other comments? Any other questions? Jeez, we're running out of time. Um, uh, how is your inner work going, uh, uh, everyone? Angelica, I'll go to you. How is your inner work? Um, your ability to be present. Last week you talked about moving the table and moving the dog bowl and sitting in a different place. Um, how was it this week? Yes, uh, I thought it was uh, possible for me to make all this change and trying to be present uh, as much as I could last week until now. Uh, and what I, I felt uh, positive was that uh, when I wake up, I become with this formatory thinking and with this uh, decision exercise and practice some dance movement, good job movements, I, I um, per perceived what I felt, I had less formatory thinking, you know, uh, I was more, more present, more present, with this exercise, 
Sweet. <laughs> He's pulled my earplugs out. Uh, okay. Um, any problems with your inner work? Any places where you suddenly go, oh, I've lost it? Um, uh, yes. Uh, it, it's difficult with English, but I, I try to say. Um, I had uh, last day, last two, day, two days, and some people here around me made a part, a big part. And we said funky music, a very loud sound. And it, it was for me difficult to be centered and not to, uh, fall into anger and negative emotion and everything together and it was hard to be centered but after two days I guess I can say was uh, I could do something yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's a very interesting observation because our environment uh, can play a huge factor in our ability to be present. Um, I'm very lucky and I assume, and I have a feeling we're all similarly lucky in terms of that we're more introverted mm -hmm. and that we spend more quiet time mm -hmm. um, away from other people. Uh, it's much harder to be present and doing inner work when you're in a jangly environment and people are moving around you and there's all this noise and all of these things going on. Um, Excuse me. No, this is, I guess, no, I guess not, I'm sure. It's the most difficult point for me uh, actually in my life is just noise and when come a very big noise and people speaking loud and music that so loud and this is really hard for me. I am uh, very sensible with uh, noises, you know, <laughs> I must do efforts to don't make bad for me, but bad for my dog and for other people and this vibration you know this sound mm -hmm. and this involved oh, come come and i must stop this and it's hard yeah it's hard yeah but i i do yeah um you know that mr gurdjieff wrote beelzebub tales in noisy crowded places and you know, someone said to him, uh, actually it was uh, um, the German translator, uh, Louise Welsh, or Louise Marsh, who said, Mr. Gurdjieff, why do you write in these terrible places? And he said it, it brought more of the humanity out within him. But I think part of it as well was the ability to be able to focus in the places where people are making noise and stuff like that it's it's a it's an indication of a high level of attainment and so to put ourselves in situations that are challenging that uh, are upsetting too much noise too many people and to try to do the inner work in those circumstances really accentuates the inner work and uh, um, it's a, a good to do good to try um, any other questions? We've got like, you know, three or four minutes remaining. Anything briefly that... Uh, we're all... Brian, any questions quickly? Uh, um, I have some questions, but I don't know if they'd be brief. <laughs> um, but maybe uh, if you can cut off the answer we can talk about next time is... I'm pretty fascinated by the idea of the, the moon feeding on us. Okay. And maybe you could either maybe touch on it now or get into it next week, but that's, um, I'm definitely interested in that idea. 
Yeah, you and pretty well, uh, actually it's disappeared from my screen, you and pretty well everyone else who's ever been involved in these teachings. Um, but yeah, I can explain that, but you're right, it is a long and complicated explanation. Um, when I talk about the earth, and I talk about the state of waking sleep being ruled by hydrogen 48, and the state of personal consciousness uh, being fueled by hydrogen 24, and the awakened state being fueled by hydrogen 12. Um, there's another state within us, and it's fueled by hydrogen 96. So it's twice as dense, half as intelligent, half as aware, half as conscious as the mechanical state of world 24. And when we enter into that state, and it's the state of homicidal rage, road rage, where these we become negative emotions, where we become the homicidal rage. Uh, that's where we feed the moon um, at that level with those emotions. So wars, for instance, because of the homicidal rage and just the negativity are places that the moon gets fed. Um, anytime we're just, we're so angry, we lose it, or we're so upset that nothing makes sense to us, we're actually feeding the moon. Um, we are down at that low energy state, and it's really, it's a metaphor and it's not a metaphor. Um, but when we are at world 96, when we are operating at that real dense, and it's an emotional level, and it's a negative, homicidal, uh, just complete lacking in any kind of awareness or sensibility. Uh, I call it the lose it emotions. You know, I wish I was dead. That's a, that's a little bit high for that kind of emotion at world 96 and we've all experienced those emotions and when we give into those emotions we are feeding the moon but this is a good topic i will i will you know perhaps start uh next meeting talking a bit more about this um i can bring up some charts and some understandings and make it a bit more explicable uh so that we can begin to understand it's the thing that people who don't understand these teachings, they use to make fun of them. They do a quick Google search, they come across a quote or two, and then they make fun of them. Um, there was a video by Sam Harris, and I'm not a big fan of Sam Harris, where in 30 seconds he demolishes the Gurdjieff teachings simply because he quotes that feeding the moon. So this is obviously all ridiculous because of this. And he doesn't understand that there's a profound truth in that. And it's related to the ray of creation, the octave of beings and the levels of energy and everything. It's when we're really dense, when we're really negative, when we're really homicidal, when we're just not thinking we're feeding the moon. Um, at any rate, uh, I'll leave with, uh, you know, that, 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 uh, um, comment. And uh, thank you guys for coming, and thanks uh, to those of you who are watching both on YouTube when I finally upload this, and who are watching now on Facebook. Um, I'm going to remember to try and shut it down because I shut down the Zoom, and then it keeps on recording for like an hour on Facebook, just uh, nothing. Hopefully I won't do that anymore. Um, at any rate, thank you all for coming. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all next week. And Sana couldn't make it today. Um, she's in Turkey. She's spending the day with her family. So she said uh, uh, her, her, her blessings or whatever for us. So take care, everyone. Bye.